Oni Madden was buried on the evening of April 24, 1965, in a cemetery near his home in Hot Springs, Arkansas. His neighbors reflected on the quiet man they had known for 30 years. But others in the congregation had memories that went back further. They remembered a man they used to call Oni Killer Madden, Duke of the West Side. Tony Madden is the most important Irish-American gangster that you've never heard of. He's the most important American cultural figure that you've never heard of. He's one of the most important political figures that you've never heard of. And the reason you've never heard of him is that he made it his point for you not to hear of him. Oni's father, Francis Madden, was from Mayo, and his mother, Mary O'Neill, was from Sligo. Shortly after they married, they moved from the west of Ireland to Liverpool in search of a better life. Oni Vincent Madden was born there in 1891, the second of three children. The mother left uh, from Liverpool and sailed to New York ahead of her family. We know that his father, Francis, died in Liverpool and that the three children came over by themselves in 1904 and then uh, she lost Oni almost immediately to the streets. Mary did her best to keep control of the family. They settled in a one-bedroom department on 10th Avenue in the middle of Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen, like the Five Points neighborhood of an earlier generation, became no notorious as a breeding ground for gangsters. And there was one gang in particular, the Gophers, were a large gang based in Hell's Kitchen. They controlled much of the street level criminal activity along the west side of Manhattan. Hell's Kitchen was gangs of New York territory, known as Hell on Earth. Living here meant you had to know how to survive. Oni knew that in Hell's Kitchen, the only ones who had anything were the gangsters, because gangsters took what they wanted. And tough gangsters kept what they had. Madden established himself in this criminal universe as someone who was quick with his fists and quick with a gun. He had allegedly killed five people by the time he was 16 years old. He saw this world of violence and gangsterism in Hell's Kitchen as a way for him to rise up in society. And by the time he was 16, he had established such a reputation that he was the leader of the Gopher Gang. Madden wasn't a very big man, but he sometimes referred to as that banty little rooster from hell, a kind of typical hot-headed Celtic punk. He would brain people with lead pipes. Uh, he shot a, an Italian named Luigi Malinucci over some imagined slight. Uh, another, his second murder was a kid named Willie Henshaw, who he actually followed all the way up to Harlem and then trailed back on the streetcar and shot him on the streetcar because Henshaw had asked out one of Madden's girlfriends. Oni soon earned the nickname that would remain with him for life, Oni the Killer. This name cast fear into the hearts of everyone on the streets of New York. When he killed Willie Henshaw, although he did it in full view of everybody on the streetcar, nobody would testify against him. Oni Madden had a long, long juvenile criminal record, but perhaps one of the most distinctive aspects of the Irish-American underworld was the way in which the criminal apparatus had the ability to manipulate the system, uh, both the political system and the judicial system, to get out of prison, to be sent before a judge who was bought off by the machine, who was part of the Tammany apparatus. Oni disregarded the law, but gang law was another story, and before long, Madden was causing trouble with rival gangs also. 
The Gophers were rivals of a downtown gang known as the Hudson Dusters. The Hudson Dusters were located in a lower portion of Manhattan, also on the waterfront. There often was a rivalry between these two gangs for control of various criminal rackets along the waterfront. The Hudson Dusters were called the Hudson Dusters because they were near the river at the point where it actually is the Hudson River, and they were also cocaine addicts. They were usually dusted out of their minds, and as a result, they were very crazy, brave gangsters. Up until then, Oni seemed to be living a charmed life. But on November 6, 1912, his luck ran out in the Arbor Dance Hall in the middle of the Hudson Dusters territory. The Dusters had been after Oni since the day he killed Luigi Malinucci, and they wanted revenge. They knew about Oni's weakness for women, and they had the perfect bait for him. He was talking to her in the dance hall when a number of gunmen, unbeknownst to him, had entered the club. He didn't notice the Hudson Dusters coming up behind him. So before he knew it, even though he was armed, he was surrounded. He was shot, and they pulled out their guns, and they emptied their pistols into him. They, they tattooed him from the breastbone to the groin, basically. They shot him 11 times, left him for dead on the floor of the dance hall. The police arrived, took Oni Madden away, didn't know whether they were going to be going to the morgue or a hospital because he had 11 bullets in him. Oni was very lucky. He was brought to hospital where he had six bullets removed. Five more were left in his body and they would go to the grave with him. The doctors were surprised at how quickly Oni recovered. But they didn't know why he was in a hurry back to the streets. The upshot of that attack at the Arbor Dance Hall um, meant that he wanted his revenge. And so he got it uh, a little while later when he attacked the head of the Hudson Duster gang, a guy named Little Patsy Doyle. Patsy Doyle knew that Oni was after him, but he would have to find him first. Madden hit upon the notion of using two of his girlfriends, Frida Horner and Margaret Everdeen, uh, to lure little Patsy Doyle into Nash's cafe. Patsy Doyle took the bait and he was lured to a bar where Oni had two gunmen waiting. Although Oni was nowhere near the scene of Doyle's shooting, police decided to charge him with his murder. Oni was sure that he would not be convicted, but the state had two sound witnesses. The girls turned on him and both testified against him, which he really took very poorly because Mann's theory was that every pretty girl in New York was either his girlfriend or potentially his girlfriend, if she wasn't actually his ex-girlfriend. So when the two girls uh, were given state's witness protection, uh, they, they ratted him out. At the trial, the girlfriend testified, a number of other people testified, and before it was all done, the case against uh, Oni Madden was strong enough to lead to his conviction, and Oni Madden was sent to Sing Sing prison. Madden's sentence consisted of a minimum of 10 years and a maximum of 20 years in Sing Sing prison. He would return to the streets eight years later, a new man. Madden often said that it was a fateful day that he first set foot in Sing Sing prison. It was his first step on the road to greatness. On 
February 1st, 1923, Oni Madden walked out of Sing Sing early due to good behavior. He had spent eight years of his life in prison and he emerged a calmer, more sensible man. Madden realized there was no percentage in getting murdered, whether by the cops or by fellow gangsters, and that if he played his cards right, he could actually win this thing. Oni had changed during his eight years in prison, but so had New York. The era of gangs was over. The gophers and dusters were gone, but there was a new racket in the city. Prohibition was well underway, and there was huge money to be made, from the supply of illegal alcohol to the public. Prohibition is the sort of signal turning point in man's life and in American life. This was a boon to gangland like nobody's business. So when Madden got out of Sing Sing in the mid-1920s, we were suddenly looking at, we were already five or six years into Prohibition. And when he got out, he, he joined a man named Larry Fay, who uh, was already a bootlegger. Oni started hijacking lorries containing booze and smuggling high-quality liquor from Canada with the help of some of his friends from the old days. Demand outstripped supply, and by 1924, Madden bought the famous brewery, the Phoenix Cereal Brewing Company. In two years, Oni gained control of the biggest illegal alcohol business in America. He would import scotch, gin and vodka from Canada, Cuba and even the UK and distribute the alcohol all over the States. Oni Madden was looking for a place to sell his illegal booze. So he came uptown and saw this location and decided this is where he wanted to open his uh, club. And uh, he named it Cotton Club. It opened in around 1923. And he had all the high rollers and politicians coming from downtown, uptown, after hours. I guess he had all the politicians in his pocket so he could get away with it. He had all the best entertainment, the best everything. He, he went with the best. I can admire that about him. He was strictly uh, class and he had a class operation. A diamond car with people like the wheels. I mean, you, you had this incredible talent in the, in the Cotton Club. I mean, Duke Ellington, I, uh, constantly in there, and Cap Calloway, and uh, Lena Horne. It was a phenomenon, and everybody went there. Gloria Swanson, uh, Jimmy Cagney, Charlie Chaplin, they all show up at the Cotton Club. During the 1920s in New York, the Cotton Club was where all the action was. People came from near and far to catch a glimpse of the Duke of the West Side, Oni Madden. All the trappings of the Prohibition era, the nightclubs and the restaurants and a whole sort of glamorous social world that now was part of the criminal world was something new. It was particularly new for Irish or Irish Americans who had come from the gutter with dirt on their shoes. The image of the gangster was very much a part of that. Oni Madden, Legs Diamond, these people were, became glamorous figures. They had a certain way of carrying themselves. They were street smart in a way that became attractive to people. Uh, Jimmy Cagney, the great star of his era, the great movie star of the 20s and 30s, patterned his whole persona on Oni Madden. In three generations, they've gone from being these ignorant spalpeen patties who don't know anything about cities to the epitome of urban sophistication. Urban cool begins with those gangsters. Due to all these things, Oni Madden influenced the shape of American culture. He was very important in the sporting world. He owned five heavyweight champions in the world. He was very active in Tammany Hall democratic politics in New York, and he was, among other things, Mae West's lover, and he produced all of her shows on Broadway. But he wasn't without enemies, and Donegal man Vincent Mad Dog Call was his biggest foe. Call had worked for one of the most notorious criminals of that time, a Jewish criminal named Dutch Schultz, who he later fell out with, and Call formed his own gang. Gangsters like Call were out of control, and their brutal violence drew unwanted attention to Oni Madden's business. 
you had this attempt by some of the overlords of the underworld to form a ruling commission. And they decide to get together and hold a conference in Atlantic City in 1929 that becomes really the first major underworld conference in the United States. Madden was the only Irishman there, among other well-known gangsters like Al Capone, Mayor Lansky, and Dutch Schultz. Italians and Jews would form a group separate from the Irish in which they said the Irish already have control of the police department and certain aspects of the political machine. Therefore, we should control the streets. And so you had loose cannon gangsters like Mad Dog Call and Legs Diamond in New York. It was determined that those people needed to be eliminated. And because Call, for instance, or Diamond were Irish American, the responsibility of eliminating that rogue faction was given to Madden. Madden and Call had a history. Oney had introduced Call to the illegal liquor trade, but the relationship had soured. It didn't take Madden long to take his revenge. Call was living in a flop house on 23rd Street with his girlfriend, Lottie Kreisberger, and Madden got word to him that he wanted to talk to him. So Call went across the street to the south side of 23rd Street and went to a drugstore to talk to him on the telephone. So Call went and he called Oni Madden, and they were engaged in a long, protracted conversation negotiating how Call might work his way back into the operation. Madden kept Call talking on the phone while he sent his gunmen over. As he continued negotiating with him, his gunmen came closer and closer. At that moment, a car pulled up, and out came uh, Bo Weinberg, who was considered the greatest artist with the Tommy gun of any of the gangsters. Oney had solved one problem, but there was more to come. The heyday of the Irish mob was over. Oney didn't want to die like Mad Dog Call and decided to leave Manhattan. He had paid a few visits south to Hot Springs in Arkansas, where he had a fine hotel, and some friends from the entertainment industry often visited him there. He had also met Agnes Demby, the postmaster's daughter, and they had formed a close bond. Oney planned to marry her and settle in Hot Springs. Now, there's some evidence that Madden greased his way out of New York by cutting a deal with the Roosevelt administration that in exchange for leaving the city, he would be allowed to operate in peace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, I'm not sure that that's ever going to be provable, but the fact is that Oney was left relatively unmolested to run the state of Arkansas as a criminal enterprise for the next 30 years. Oni Madden was a rare type of gangster. He became sort of a gangster in retirement in Hot Springs and presided over a town that would become known as sort of a way station for gangsters on the lam. He was lucky enough to die of natural causes, to die of old age, which is rare for most of the characters in this story. One of the things that can be accredited to Madden is that the Irish in America played a more prominent role in politics. People like Madden knew they wouldn't succeed in the long term and that they were better off using the system from the inside. I think they just looked around and said, you know, it's easier to steal when you're on the right side of the law than if you're the bad guy because you can end up dead. And Madden's great achievement was he didn't end up dead, he died uh, in bed. I think, on balance, he was probably a very bad but very great man. He came through Hell's Kitchen. He ruled New York. And he was one of the few who lived to tell the tale. Oni Madden was the mobster who got away. In 1934, in a small wood 100 miles east of Chicago, the man known as Public Enemy Number One, 
John Dillinger, buried a body in the ground. Many years later, he claimed it was the final resting place of his comrade, the Irish-Canadian gangster John Red Hamilton. John Red Hamilton was someone who narrowed his outlook down to survival only. But then again, that's typical of someone who knows that he's hunted, knows that sooner or later it's all going to come to the end, and doesn't even think about the future because as far as he knows, he doesn't have one. John Red Hamilton was well used to fighting for survival. He grew up in an Irish immigrant community in the small mining town of Bing Inlet in southern Ontario. It was a tough town where only the strongest survived. He lost his father at a relatively young age and as the saying used to go back then, he grew up wild. And uh, Red began to get into trouble. He was described as being a very bright child, but he was also somewhat adventurous. He'd do almost anything on a dare. And in one incident, uh, trying to outrun a, a train with his sleigh, he had an accident and he lost several fingers off of his right hand, which earned him the nickname Three Finger Jack. Gradually, young Hamilton fell in with criminal gangs who were exporting alcohol into America from Canada illegally. Red was already well on his way to a life of crime. His story was similar to a lot of other uh, people who became well-known criminals in the Depression era. They had their introduction to crime through the bootlegging of the 1920s. In 1925, Hamilton joined forces with the Stevenson brothers and they began robbing banks. They robbed a bank of $25,000 in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but they got caught. He'd gotten away with a few robberies, got away clean, and then he pulled a robbery with someone who got caught and uh, quickly spilled the beans on him. And, uh, and that was how Red wound up going to jail. Red Hamilton was sentenced to 25 years in prison in 1927. Prison at that time was uh, much more geared toward punishment than it was toward rehabilitation. The prison world was a pretty grim one, and uh, if you were going to survive behind bars, you had to be a pretty tough character. Red Hamilton was known as being the quiet type. I think uh, he had enough of a reputation that most of the other convicts knew enough to leave him alone. He also got hooked up with one of the toughest guys in the prison, Harry Pierpont. Now, uh, Harry was a notorious bank robber. Red Hamilton made friends with him, as well as such characters as Fat Charlie Mackley and Russell Booby Clark. And a, a young man got transferred there by the name of John Herbert Dillinger. You deserve nothing. What you got? Dillinger at this time was, in, in the prison world, he'd be what they considered a punk. He had got caught in a like a two-bit grocery store robbery, but the judge decided to throw the book at him, which really embittered Dillinger, and he got into the circle of friends of Red Hamilton and Harry Pierpont and company. Dillinger was keen to learn from Hamilton how to rob banks, and although Dillinger may have been younger and not so well known, they liked and respected him. Hamilton and Pierpont looked out for Dillinger while in prison and they knew that he would do the same for them, if necessary. Since Dillinger was going to be the first one to be paroled, Hamilton and Pierpont gave him a list of banks to rob so that he'd be able to finance an escape for them and the rest of their gang. Just three weeks after he had been released on parole, he had already robbed 10 banks. Back in jail, Hamilton and the rest of the gang waited patiently while Dillinger used the stolen money to pay prison officers to smuggle three handguns into the prison. Prison escapes at that time usually worked if you placed bribes in the right places. The guns were smuggled into them in a box of thread that was going into the shirt making factory in the prison.
Pierpont and Hamilton got the guns and they used them to subdue a couple of guards and uh, uh, make their way to the prison gate. They did shoot one guard in the course of the breakout, although not fatally. And when they got out through the gates, they went across the road to a gas station where they commandeered a car and, and made their break while the, while the sirens were wailing. Red and his criminal friends were free again, thanks to John Dillinger. Together, they would blaze a trail across the towns of the US Midwest, forming one of the most notorious bank robbing gangs the country had ever seen. A lot of these guys that were in Michigan City and in South American penitentiaries, some of them had been involved with American prohibition, many of them. It was and when Prohibition was over, they weren't going to go out and get jobs as steady eddies. They were going to find something else to do. And the more dangerous of them became bank robbers, and they went around robbing just about any bank they felt like. On October 23, 1933, Dillinger's gang set out to rob a bank in Greencastle, Indiana. The gang were known for being very professional, and they would monitor the bank for several days beforehand. Their robberies were very well planned. They would have getaway cars placed at different places so they could ditch one car and get into another one. They would have their escape routes planned. They tried to avoid shooting if they could. There was an old farmer standing at the cashier's desk and then Dillinger looked at the pile of money and he said, is that yours or the bank's? And the farmer said, it's mine. And Dillinger said, keep it. We only want the bank's money. And he was allowed to leave with his property. They timed the robberies. If somebody said, OK, time's up, if there was money still in the bank, they would just say, leave it, let's get out of here. Because if you got greedy, that's what got you caught. Over the next two months, the Dillinger gang was suspected of being involved in a string of bank robberies in seven different states. During this time, his criminal gang were on the crest of a wave that was sweeping across America. John Dillinger and Red Hamilton were both uh, products of the 1930s, the Depression era. People were in desperate circumstances and that bred a uh, species of criminal known as the outlaws. You had Bonnie and Clyde terrorizing the Midwest, Babyface Nelson, Charles Pretty Boy Floyd. They captured the public imagination because they s supposedly took from the rich and gave to the poor, which was typically themselves and their families. Banks were foreclosing on people all over the place. Farmers were losing their homes and their, their farms. Everybody hated the banks with a passion. So along come people like John Hamilton and John Dillinger, and they're robbing the banks. So the people began to put this, you know, Robin Hood image onto these guys, even though they, they really didn't deserve it. The reality was so bleak that uh, a lot of people viewed the outlaws and their exploits and their encounters with the police as a form of entertainment. What they did was really give the public something to focus on besides their own dire circumstances. You probably could say that John Dillinger was America's first celebrity outlaw. Uh, everybody was following what was going on. When you got home from work, you turned on the radio to, to listen to what was the latest going on with the Dillinger gang, or the Barker gang, or the Barrow gang, or, or whomever. America was gripped daily by stories of the robberies, but in Washington, D.C., a young, ambitious bureaucrat saw a golden opportunity. J. Edgar Hoover was, um, head, he was the head of the Department of Investigation, which eventually became the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They were a small department at the time without an awful lot of power, but Hoover saw how he could manipulate these bank robbers into uh, political power by, by building them up in the press. Hoover knew that if he made them larger than life, 
then when he got his chance to go after them, he would in turn appear larger than life for, for bringing them down. It, it has often been said that, um, that John Dillinger made J. Edgar Hoover. At the end of 1933, a list of well-known criminals was published, which would become known as America's Most Wanted. John Dillinger was at the top of the list, public enemy number one. In second place was his right-hand man, the Irish gangster, John Red Hamilton. The United States was now in the grip of criminal hands, but if one place could be called the capital city of crime, it had to be Chicago, where the Italian mob was in charge. Chicago was known as a gangster's hangout because there was a crooked administration. If you went there and you knew who to, whose palm to grease, you know, you were relatively assured of safety, but you could never be entirely sure. This was a situation that Red Hamilton ran into. He found a girlfriend in Chicago. He bought her a car and, uh, they had to have a, a, a bumper fixed on this fancy new roadster that he bought her. So they put it into a garage and then they went and saw a movie. And meanwhile, the Chicago police were tipped off that a member of the Dillinger gang had put a car into a garage to have something fixed. So a detective went there to check it out and he ran into Red Hamilton Without hesitation, Hamilton pulled a gun and shot him dead. And uh, which, which shows that, uh, you know, if, if Hamilton had to kill to remain free, he would do so. Although Chicago was controlled by the mob, you still couldn't shoot a policeman for no reason. As a massive search for the killer was mounted, it was time for Red Hamilton and the other gangsters to hit the road and hide out in the southern states until things had settled down. They had their girlfriends with them and the women would go ahead and they would rent the places and they would, uh, they would get the food in. Uh, as you probably know, in, in those days, a gangster's girlfriend was called a mall. Dillinger and Billy Frechette had a fairly close relationship and she did break him out of jail once, but the rest were really girlfriends. They were add-ons. They were there more for convenience and also to use as a camouflage. And the sad thing was, is that in the end, the men had absolutely no compunction about abandoning them, leaving them behind. You always had some things ready to go. Uh, you had money in your pocket just in case you had to bolt, and you were armed wherever you went. So it... Um, it really was not an ideal way to live. There was noth nothing romantic or, or glamorous about it. On New Year's Eve, Hamilton and the gang put their worries behind them and celebrated the arrival of 1934. But the coming year would be bloody and violent, and for many of them, it would be the last year they would see. with machine guns, strode into the Merchants Trust and Savings Bank and stole $28,000. Then they cut loose with their machine guns, killed a policeman, and wounded four bystanders. During the bank robbery in East Chicago, a policeman, William Patrick O'Malley, was killed. The gang fled with the money from the bank, but Red was injured during the escape. There has long been a dispute as to whether John Dillinger actually was at that robbery. J. Edgar Hoover blamed it on John Dillinger because he wanted the public to see that Dillinger was a killer as well as a robber. It seems more likely that it was Red Hamilton and somebody else. And um, Hamilton was, was wounded in the shootout and he was convalescing in Chicago. Dillinger brought Red to a doctor they knew in Chicago for treatment. After a period of time, Hamilton still wasn't strong enough to go back on the road. So a former girlfriend, 
Pat Sherrington came to help them. Down, relax. <sighs> Hamilton needed time to recover from his injuries, and in order to throw the police off the scent, Dillinger circulated stories to the press that Red had been killed. But Dillinger and the rest of the gang should have been covering their own tracks. Some of the gang headed for Tucson, Arizona, and shortly thereafter, the police in Tucson became aware that members of the Dillinger gang were, were in their midst. And one by one, they caught Harry Pierpont, Fat Charlie, and Booby Clark, and then they caught Dillinger himself. And this would be the end of the line for Pierpont and Clark and Mackley. It looked like it would be the end of the line for Dillinger too, unless he could get a message to the last member of the gang who was still on the outside. John Red Hamilton. Luckily for Dillinger, the cameras were never too far away. The time that he was captured and taken to the Crown Point Jail, if you ever get to see that bit of newsreel, you can see him sort of hamming it up a little bit for the camera. And there's a part where he puts his arm on the shoulder of, uh, I forget if it's the governor of the state or someone, and he goes like this. And some people have interpreted that as a signal to his guys who might be watching this in a movie theater on a newsreel, this is, get me a gun. And it is believed that it was Red Hamilton who set things up for, for John Dillinger to break out of the Crown Point Jail. Dillinger escapes from Indiana Jail after taking away pistol from guard, a point of a self-made wooden gun. <laughs> Trust Johnny, huh? This is the reason a man killer is free. Mm -hmm. Commandeers sheriff's own car. Take a Negro captive oh, no. along on his flight. Hey, he never does anything quietly. <laughs> Johnny's out. Hamilton and Dillinger were together again but with all their old gang members either dead or in prison. They needed to recruit some new faces. They decided to team up with Homer Van Meter and Babyface Nelson, an infamous villain known for being a psychotic killer. And they set off on another spate of bank robberies. Red Hamilton was the only person who was actually a member of both Dillinger gangs. At that time, J. Edgar Hoover believed that Red Hamilton was the brains of the outfit. J. Edgar Hoover was a master strategist, a master showman, politician. A lot of his moves in retrospect are extremely Machiavellian. He made the outlaws seem like a threat to national security. So of course he would have money, he would have all sorts of resources poured into their extermination. Outlaws were at a disadvantage in that they were the first American criminals to have their pictures, to have news of their exploits advertised in film. And the FBI and other law enforcement agencies made good use of that by broadcasting newsreels. So the outlaws were much easier to spot. The outlaws were forced to go from one place to another. They could never put down roots anywhere. There's an urban legend, who knows if it's true or not, that John Dillinger was standing in a backyard of a property that they were temporarily staying at it at, and he was had his hand against a tree and he was looking at it. And finally, somebody said to him, it's a tree, John, what are you looking at? And he says, all I can keep thinking is that this is the only thing here that has any roots. And he was right. In April 1934, tired of constantly moving about, the gang decided to take refuge in an isolated lodge in Wisconsin called Little Bohemia. What they didn't know was that Hoover and the FBI had received a tip-off regarding their whereabouts, and the FBI were preparing to strike. He did not inform the local police because he did not want to have to share the glory with them. 
So the FBI agents went in there not knowing the lay of the land. They did not have local police who could have told them that there's a back door out of this place and a trail through the woods where somebody can escape. The FBI agents did all the shooting and they killed an innocent man and wounded another man. The outlaws went out the back window and they just took off. That was a huge embarrassment for J. Edgar Hoover. His men not only killed an innocent man, but they let all of the outlaws escape. As the gang were making their escape through Minnesota, shots were fired at the car with Hamilton inside, and one of the bullets hit him in the back, leaving him almost dead. Dillinger took Hamilton to Chicago. They tried to find an underworld doctor who would treat him, but by this time, the Dillinger gang was so hot, like nobody would have anything to do with them. They were, they were bringing too much law down on everybody. The outlaws had thrown the heat not only on themselves, but on the organized criminals to an extent that the mob had just basically put out a blanket order to have nothing to do with these guys. It is believed that John Red Hamilton died, and according to Dillinger, they buried him in a grave outside Chicago. And within a few months, Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, and most of the second gang were all in hiding. However, the story doesn't end there, because even to this day, controversy surrounds the death of John Red Hamilton. J. Edgar Hoover insisted that the remains were Hamilton's because he wanted the ends all neatly tied up. No, no, no loose ends left over, Hamilton is dead, the Dillinger gang is all gone. However, there is a man, a resident of New Mexico named Bruce Hamilton, who is a great nephew of Red Hamilton. And he told me that uh, around about 1950, 1951, Bruce Hamilton says that they met a man, he said, whom I was told was my uncle, Red Hamilton, who was supposed to have been killed by the FBI in 1934. He said they actually did get medical aid for him, and when he was well enough, he crossed the border into Canada, and he had a, a cabin on an island where he lived in relative freedom, secretly, up until his death sometime in the 1970s, and he just let the FBI think that he was dead.